Well, greetings, everyone. David Arendelle here to share with you another one of my recent conference presentations, Moving Forward with Anti-Racism Policies and Practices for Peer Learning Groups. Now, this particular presentation was given in connection with a regional supplemental instruction conference that was uh, sponsored by one of the institutions in Texas. One of the key things I want you to notice here is this web link here that's located on the front page. I highly encourage you to go to that website because the PowerPoint slides and all of the resources that I talk about inside the presentation are all going to be available for you to be able to download off of the website. I go pretty quickly whenever I do these presentations because it's a lesson my students taught me. Don't read all the PowerPoint slides, and particularly whenever I do a re-recording like this of a presentation, I move along pretty quickly because you have the opportunity to use your pause button in order to give you time to write down some notes or notice a web link but in particular, make sure that you take advantage of this particular website to go to. It's going to be active uh, for the next uh, period of time, and all of those resources are available for you. Well, what is it that we know about campus culture? Because culture has such an important impact on whether or not students are engaged with the classroom environment, whether they feel like they have a sense of belonging and inclusion. Well, Dr. Alexander Aston did probably one of the best research studies, he and his colleagues and his graduate students, about what factors make a difference with students in college. And what he found was, was this basic formula here of the time of exposure, when it was that the students are exposed, how intense the experience or exposure is, and then finally, it's going to be a function of the quantity and the quality of this. That is what helps to define what is impact. And that's one of the things that we're going to apply as we look at issues of racism and how they are so detrimental on campus for our students of color and harmful for the majority of students as well because it develops unhealthy patterns of behavior and thought for them as well. Going and looking at customer research, they talk about the issue of moments of truth. And a moment of truth is a specific time and event in history, in time whenever a customer comes into contact with some aspect of the organization. Every single time that a customer evaluates whether or not what they have paid for their experience in terms of time and money is really worth it in terms of what they receive. Now, that seems like that that works whenever you're looking at your experience at Starbucks or whether you go back or not, or a fast food restaurant or a fine restaurant or a shopping store. But we also find this exact same issue applies inside of education. And what is it that students are experiencing on a moment-by-moment -moment basis? And we now find that this makes the difference for students in terms of retention at the institution as well as in terms of engagement with the curriculum. One relationship can make the difference, and this comes from the research from the Noel Levitz organization, which for a generation has provided us the best literature and research studies to understand why do students persist in college and why do they leave. And what they found was it's this issue of one person can make such an enormous difference if they are able to feel like a connection has been made between the two and a positive one. However, it doesn't really make any difference what the role of the person is. That's what's really been quite surprising in the research. It can be an advisor, an instructor, 
or another student or anyone in between in terms of making the difference whether you end up staying or not. And this also helps to understand why the co-curricular experience of students with clubs, Greek organizations, teams, jobs, band, and the rest has such a powerful influence on students. You know, Dr. Tinto has taught us this. You probably have seen this PowerPoint slide over the decades. This really dates back for me probably at least 30 years. And for me, whenever I used to go out and talk about supplemental instruction, which was something that I ended up having a strong connection with, uh, uh, helping to do training um, workshops, conducting research, and publications at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, I tended to focus on these first two PowerPoint slides up here, these first two points. Uh, the difficulty with academic, um, they have so much difficulty with the academic um, rigor of a course, as well as the incongruence. Can they make the connection between what the professor is saying, what's going on in the textbook or the assigned readings, and what's in going on inside of their own heads? And I often talked about, well, this is the reason why supplemental instruction is able to be so helpful. In recent years, I've begun to understand on how I was ignoring the bottom three of the uh, PowerPoints uh, of Dr. Uh, Tinto in terms of adjustment, social isolation, negative social group pressure on reading why it was the students were making a decision whether or not to drop out of the institution or not. In recent years, Dr. Tinto has spent more time talking about solutions rather than only identifying the reasons why students drop out of school. And it's this whole issue up here of belonging that he's been and many others have been talking about. Just simply take a search of uh, Google Scholar and you'll find thousands of publications and research studies that are talking to us about how if you don't have a sense of belonging, then you very well may end up making the decision to depart. Maybe you'll depart from the academic major that you're in and you'll select another one where you have a better fit uh, or sense of belonging. Or you'll end up making a decision to transfer to another institution or to drop out of higher education completely then. The point, though, is what kind of atmosphere is being presented to the student? And does the student feel like they are engaged? And do they feel like that they belong? You know, what is it that's going on inside of here that develops a sense of belonging? Well, one of the greatest attacks on a sense of belonging is racism. And I think part of the reason why you've not seen as much attention to this in the professional literature dating back 10, 20, 30 years ago was most of the people that were doing the literature or writing were people of the dominant culture inside the United States. They were not thinking about what were these moments of truth that students were experiencing, that our students of color were experiencing. It isn't enough to have an absence of racism. And I'll have to confess myself that I was not attuned to this issue until the last few years. I had always thought about this issue about being an absence of racism would be sufficient. It really isn't. It has to be an anti-racist environment. We've got to do more. We've got to root out the causes of racism. We have to create a learning environment that encourages all of our students to do well, whether they be inside the classroom or they be inside of the study group program sessions. An article that I would highly recommend that you pick up is this one here. See if you're able to get it through interlibrary loan or perchance your library uh, has an electronic uh, uh, subscription to the journal. 
It's only $35. I realize that's a lot, but it is the most impactful article that I have read, period, on this topic of anti-racist study group programs. They generate 24 different recommendations how to make study group programs anti-racist. How did they do it? They ended up having a qualitative study of nearly two dozen uh, students of color in a peer study group program. And they asked them. The students were reluctant, actually, to say anything negative about their experience because they desperately needed the study group program. But they warmed up grew to trust uh, trust the uh, researchers, and out of it, as I said, comes for 24 different recommendations. Those are all going to be reflected inside of this particular document, which is available through the website, Anti-Racist Activities and Policies for Student-Led Study Groups. Highly recommend this one to you. It's about 35 pages long. And it's single-spaced, and it is filled with practical, specific actions that can be taken. We're going to sample just a few of those inside of this short presentation today. Embedded, this material here is going to be embedded in this document here, which is Course-Based Learning Assistance Guide. This one is a 100 plus page a document that has everything that's up here, 35 pages, and they are embedded into this one that has a comprehensive look at recommended policies and practices for study group programs. This particular guide here can be used in conjunction with a peer-led uh, team learning program, supplemental instruction, PASS, PAL, you name the program that's out there, it doesn't replace the specific protocols that you perhaps have received training on from one of the national or international training institutes. And as a foundation for where did many of the ideas from here come from? Well, they came from the article that I just described for you, and they also came out of this anti-racism glossary that gave us specific directions on not only defining the terms, 48 terms are going to be defined, but also giving specific examples of what those things look like. I highly recommend that studying these three documents here can really help boost your particular program. Now, as I said, there's 48 definitions. We're going to be spending time looking at this one here in a little more detail on the next slide on microaggressions. The issue up here with anti-racism, it's not only opposing racist acts, but it's advocating for changes. And that's what we are really focusing on in this video and in those previous documents. You're also talking about what is the climate. And then also, what are the structural racist ways that we have a system set up in America and in too often in higher education to set up a hierarchy, and that hierarchy ends up disadvantaging those who are down, who are being disadvantaged by a negative climate that is giving them a sense that they don't belong at the institution, that there is no sense of inclusion. So let's go ahead and look at this particular document. This one here is the exact same thing as the previous one. Oops. There we go. For the middle one there, the course based learning assistance. Well, that's the exact same thing. And this shows you the detail of what's inside of this particular guide. It's been field tested with 50 programs around the United States and in two other countries. And it has been downloaded about a thousand times in terms of the draft version of it. You can see all of the different categories of the 
policies and practices inside. We're just going to sample just a few of them. It's important to realize this guide is not about judging. Nobody has enough time, money, uh, resources, uh, personnel in order to implement everything that's inside of it. But what we have is we have something that can serve as a guide and they could end up increasing your effectiveness and efficiency. So what I encourage you, consider it. Implement what you can and then have a long-term plan to try to implement more in the future. So once again, it's not about judging programs. It's just simply about providing some guidance. Now in terms, as I said, I wanted to sample a few of the 100-page uh, document for you. One of those is the first section on mission and goals. And the question is, is what kind of uh, goals do you have regarding anti-racism? And one of the goals ought to be that you're going to be serving equal or exceed the institutional diversity. That's something that you want to see. You also want to see whether your staff is meeting with people of different uh, cultural backgrounds on a regular basis in order to receive feedback. And then also that you set a goal that you're going to have continued discussions about race and gender identity, sexual identity, and all of the rest of these inside. So it's important that we have stated goals. That's good. The next level is, is the issue of assessment. And now we're going to quantify the activities that occurred during the semester. We want to know, we suggest to you, that you're measuring the gender identity and race of the people who are being served. It's important to look at the immediate outcome. Well, that's who comes to the sessions. That's important. We want to be able to say we're at least meeting or exceeding the diversity of our campus. But also, we want to take a look and see, well, what kinds of difference are we making? And if there's a difference in achievement levels between people of different races or identity groups, then there's a problem. Because that's one of the things historically that has occurred is that while uh, programs may have had a goal of serving a diverse number of students on campus, whenever they looked at who is that actually came to the sessions, well, they found that it was mostly white. Well, the question you need to ask is, is why is that occurring? And I don't pretend that we're going to answer that in short of this uh, short video here. But it's a question you need to ask is, are the students who are coming reflecting your institution? And of the students who are coming, are they having equal outcomes? And if they're not, then those are hard questions that you need to take a look at. Then you end up looking at the learning environment yourself. And this is looking at things, and these are specific things like don't permit competitive activities. And that seems kind of counterintuitive. Lots of uh, learning programs, lots of classrooms. I think back to me what I did inside of my own history classroom. I thought about this. Well, one of the problems with having competitive activities is that some students can keep up with the pace for the competitions and win the competition, and some students don't. Now, it's possible just to step back and go, well, you know, uh, some win, some don't. The question is, what is that message communicating to the students who don't finish first in the race? Are we compounding all of the negative things that they've been experiencing throughout their educational life in terms of an environment that was negative, that was not supportive, and continue to reinforce that there was something wrong with them? That's the reason why you've got to ask yourself questions. Are we provoking a lot of anxiety among the students? Are we having a false perception here about winners and losers? 
it's really important that the leaders of these study groups don't send the message that the materials are easy. Because for some of us, they're easy, some for not. It all depends how much social capital that you have. If you're a second, third generation college student, you have a much different lived experience than this is the very first time that you've ever gone to college. Anyone in your family has ever gone to college, and there isn't anyone who can provide any uh, moral support nor any recommendations. I think about that in terms of me. I had two wonderful parents, but neither one of them had gone to college. In fact, neither one of them had completed high school. I was kind of on my own whenever I went to my undergraduate institution, and I was very fortunate that I was able to successfully navigate the place, found some resources. Well, that's not always easy for everyone who wants to do so. One of the very best things that a study group leader can do is that they can share specific challenges as they had and how they struggled with the course material, how messy it was to solve problems. You know, one of the things that math teachers often have is great board work. It's a very clean, simple, easy to look at. And I appreciate that. But students sometimes make the assumptions that their scratching on the paper ought to look like what the professor does up on the blackboard or on the whiteboard. It's important to share how challenging it has been for you as a student. Also for you as a faculty member as well, but that's the subject for a different video. Program design and activities. You know, one of the things that's tough to do, and it's something that I thought about as a history teacher, too, discussion leaders got to be careful about moving the group forward. Are you waiting until everyone has successfully solved the problem? Waiting sometimes requires the leader to verbally or non-verbally uh, have to read the students and then avoid a situation in which students are embarrassed because they're not moving at the same speed as everybody else. Part of the problem is whenever you try to race through too many problems in a discussion group or, frankly, with a faculty member doing the same thing inside the classroom. It's a lot better if you have a couple of problems Make sure everyone is solving the problem, understands it, rather than trying to go through eight or nine different problems. Also making sure that one or a small group of students don't dominate the conversation. It's important that the speaking time be spread around the room, and particularly in terms of the racial composition of the discussion group. If we don't end up having people from diverse uh, cultural, gender, uh, racial backgrounds involved in the conversation, then there's a problem. Well, maybe part of this needs to be solved for having more small group discussions, breaking people up into smaller groups within the larger group. That's dealt with inside of a larger training program in terms of what it is that leaders need to do. But what we understand is that these actually become racial issues because they have a racial impact upon our population. And if we don't train for this, we don't practice with this inside of our training sessions, then we're going to replicate what too many of the students have been experiencing in their K-12 through education. In terms of the uh, professional development of the leaders, well, obviously we need to have more training, be very specific about that. We need to have them um, thinking about um, their awareness of issues, and I just simply uh, locate some of those there. And also, it's important that these study group leaders need to have written reflections. 
on a weekly, if not every other week basis throughout the academic term. We did that with our leaders at our institution, with our study group program. Every two weeks, the uh, study group leaders had a writing prompt, and they had to write one or more paragraphs about their experience, what they observed, and what they were learning from their role as a study group leader. The research literature is profound on the importance of reflection. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I changed in a major way how I taught my history course, which I had been doing on and off for several decades, to have more reflections, less formal examinations. I found I understood what my students were learning better through the reflections, and the students told me they liked writing better than high-pressure examinations, particularly ones that had multiple-choice questions and things like that. That simply didn't allow them to really express what they had learned. Well, the same thing was also true for the discussion group leaders of these um, study groups. Have some prompting questions where you ask them things about what have you noticed about your students of color inside of your groups? What have you done in order to help involve everyone in the discussions? Just some simple little prompts like this Get them to think about their experience and about changes that they could make. They're not judging them. We're just simply asking them to reflect. And the literature is so clear that reflection leads to deeper learning more than formal examinations, for example. In terms of program leadership, it's so critical that the administrator or manager of the study group program has got to make the final hiring decision. It's one of the things that I didn't push hard enough whenever I was involved with training of supplemental instruction programs in Kansas City back in the day. We talked about this, but I don't think we really pushed it hard enough because I've heard much too often on how study group uh, program managers feel coerced into hiring the students that the faculty members recommend. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Well, what would be an ideal profile for a facilitator? Well, no one is perfect. No one has all of these characteristics. And this is a good example of a PowerPoint uh, slide that will prompt you maybe to hit the pause button to see the amount of detail Let me just hit a couple of them. That they had a B or an A in the course. You notice that I say B. In fact, there's some argument that a B minus is enough. Well, why would they end up saying that? Because it's more important that we get someone who understands the challenges with the course material and has patience to help all the students to succeed. We don't want someone who's in there, who thinks it's easy, tells everyone how easy it is, quickly runs through a bunch of problems, and then 10 or 15% of the students in the group feel really satisfied, while the other students in the group are left behind and are puzzled. They need to have good organization skill, good communication skills, They also have a teachable attitude. That's really key. Sometimes uh, I've seen leaders who kind of thought that they knew it all. And I had to actually had confrontational talks with them about how they were doing things that they were trained not to do, but they were doing them. And they were not helpful. They were confused about their role. And we'll say this in a few moments, but they thought that they were teaching assistants more than they were learning assistants. And there's an enormous difference between the two. They also need to display cultural competence in being able to work with a diverse number of students. And also, they needed to, as a group, all of the leaders as a group, they need to reflect or exceed 
the demographics of the student body. That means that it's more important that I have a group that are qualified through these kinds of things up here that they also reflect the diversity of the student body. And if they don't, then I'm going to have to work harder to recruit more and then find the students in order to meet these requirements, but also reflect the diversity of the campus. Students need to be able to see self, and you can't run a program where they're all part of the majority population. That just simply isn't it. I'm not talking about reducing the quality of who you hire, because you still need to have these kinds of behaviors and attitudes, but you've got to break the um, majority-only rule. You know, one of the things um, that we want to find is that, you know, everyone is somewhere on a line between a novice and an expert. The key is, is whether they're teachable or not. This uh, profile here may not be shared with the same kind of profile who the faculty members want. Because who do faculty want? Well, I can speak as a faculty member. Faculty think that they want an A or an A-plus student. They want the very finest student. Who is it that they notice in the class? Well, they notice the students who sit on the front row. They frequently talk with them before, during, and outside of class, and they come to the office hours. And also, sometimes, they share the same demographic background. Faculty members are confused. As I said, what was it that they were when they were in grad school? How many of them were teaching assistants? A lot of them. That's how you help to pay for grad school. That's how you help to build your credentials as a future teacher. What we need are learning assistants. And... They are not necessarily the same thing. So as I said, we could spend half an hour just talking about that concept. I encourage you to stop the video and just kind of contemplate that a little bit. That's one of the biggest challenges, I think, sometimes with faculty. Faculty can recommend, but it's the program manager who recruits widely. They may end up going to... Um, uh, students of color organizations to do some of their recruiting. It's their responsibility to have a wide pool of students to select from and not just those that the faculty member wants. So as I said, you know, it takes a lot of diplomacy to try to be able to explain this to faculty members. And sometimes it helps if you provide a written copy of the requirements and expectations for the study leaders to help the faculty members understand who it is that you're looking for. As I said, they may just not understand the difference between a teaching assistant and a learning assistant. It's also important to be responsible for our learning programs. And that's the reason why it's important to have a campus-wide advisory group that is helping to provide feedback, advocate for our group, but also be responsible for us to turn in an annual report to that reports on those uh, issues that were back there in section number one and two about how we're going to reflect the diversity of the campus and who we serve and whenever you look at the uh, pass rates and the grades of the students who participate in the program, there shouldn't be any difference regarding gender identity and racial group in terms of what the outcomes were. Well, just a few final thoughts here. As I said, these publications here are all found on the website. 
And I particularly just want to give a shout out here to colleagues of color for social justice. They have significantly impacted my work. It's really this group was created uh, to function at the intersection of learning assistance and uh, race and social justice. It's a group of nearly 50 faculty, student service uh, workers across the United States and a variety of institutions. If you'd like to know more about the work of Colleagues of Color, well, there's the website address. But I highly encourage you to take advantage of those articles there, plus also that one that might cost you $35. I gotta, I know that you know money's not cheap, but in comparison to what you can get out of that article, um, I think it's worth far more. Uh, you also might be interested in some of my social media channels. You'll notice I have podcasts and the rest. Uh, there's two of them in particular, and one specially, and that is the Peer Assisted Learning Groups podcast. Currently, uh, I'm doing interviews with study group leaders and a few of the study group program coordinators 20 different colleges in Australia, Canada, and the United States. These uh, episodes are only about 10 minutes long. You can actually just go to the website here and listen to individual episodes, or you can go and you can subscribe to the podcast. Either way, but what I want to sell you on is just listen to the students' stories. They're about 10 minutes long. I only ask about five or six questions and then get to sit back and listen to the wisdom that they have to share. They talk about the different strategies that they use with groups that oftentimes they invent on their own. They never learn those during the training. They talk about what they got out of the experience personally. And then they talk about recommendations for their fellow study group leaders and program coordinators. It's really quite remarkable. And they do all of that in about 10 minutes. I highly recommend it. It's one of the most fun things that I get to do. I'd love to continue the conversation. There's my email. There's my cell phone number. Uh, I invite you to call me. Uh, I get the insurance and the automobile clubs call me all the time trying to sell me things. I'd like to have a conversation with you about what you're doing in your program, and I'd like to learn from you. All of these materials that I've been talking about, they're all available through this website here. So that's going to be active for the foreseeable future, so I highly recommend that you go there. Many, many more items uh, this is my general website address. And then if you just want to look at uh, a subset of what's in this site, well, that's what this one is down here, and it's the peer learning resources, including the link to the annotated bibliography of peer learning programs, where I've done my very best to have every single article about the six major uh, learning group programs, including supplemental instruction, or as it's called in other places, PASS or PAL, uh, peer-led team learning, structured learning assistance, and others. It's been an honor to share with you today. I've learned so much from my colleagues. I've learned so much from my students. And I'd like to be able to pass along that information that they taught me. I'd love to be able to share that with you. So please take a look at the websites. Thank you very much for listening today. Bye-bye.